Sunday in Advent, joy. Watch and wait for Christ's coming. We light this candle in hope. We light this candle for love. We light this candle in joy. Rejoice, for our Lord is coming into the darkness of oppression's exile to lead us home, as we hear in Isaiah 35, 1 through 10. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the people our hands, and steady the knees that give way. Say to, say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear, your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened, and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer, and the mute tongue shall shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness, and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbling springs. In the haunts where jackals once lay, grass and reeds and fires will grow. And a highway will be there, it will be called the way of holiness. It will be for those who walk on that way. The unclean will not journey on it, wicked fools will not go about on it. No lion will be there, nor any ravenous beast, they will not be found there. But only the redeemed will walk there and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sign will flee away. Good morning to you. Good to see everyone out this morning. Glad you're with us. Glad you're with us. Let's come before the Lord in prayer. Father, we come before your presence this morning, once again, just thanking you that we have this opportunity to come out and to worship you and to praise you and to lift our voices up before you and thanks for all that you've done for us. And now, Lord God, we just pray as we enter time to look at your word, that you bless your word, Father God, and that you reveal to us what it is that we need to know for this day, for this hour. Just speak through me, Lord God, to the church today. Use me for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Luke chapter 2. We're going to start on verse 22, and we will go to, I believe we have 22, yes, 22 to 33. Luke chapter 22, or Luke chapter 2, verses 22 to 33. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph of Mary took him to Jerusalem and presented him to the Lord. As is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves and two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. Then Joseph and his mother marveled at what was said about him. Amen. May God bless his word this morning. I'm not sure what kind of a week you had in the busyness of Christmas season as we reflect on this Advent season that we're in. And Advent is a time that we should be able to actually slow down and really reflect upon Jesus Christ and the gift that God gave to us through Him. But I'm not sure what kind of week you had. This week, I had to do something I really hated to do. This week, I 
started off when we had the snowstorm, I just decided maybe I need to put new snow tires on my car. Now, not that I hate to put new snow tires on the car, but I made an, a, an effort to call up to the tire shop and make an appointment. I did that last week for one car, and my appointment I had scheduled for 3 o'clock, and right on the nose, they took me in at 3 o'clock, and that was great. And the reason I do that is because we all have things to do in life, you know? We all have certain times that we need to be here, and here, and here, and here. So I thought, I will call up again and make me an appointment. Because I had another appointment at 4 o'clock at our district office, with Kendall Elmore and Grover Dooling. So I had to be there at four. So I thought, I'll give the tire shop a little bit of leeway. I called up and had an appointment scheduled for 2.30. And I get there, and it was rather crowded that day, but I called up that morning, and, and they assured me that there's not going to be a problem. So I go there, and, and I tell them who I am, and tell them what tires I need, and, and uh, they said, it'll be a few minutes. I said, okay, no problem. I got there a few minutes early. And I, you know, when you go to the tire shop, you see people that you know, so you visit with them a little bit, and eventually they end up leaving, and you're there. And I look over, and there's a big sign there, waiting room. And I thought, okay, well, might as well go have a seat. Now it's, then my few minutes turn into about 15 minutes. So I go to the waiting room, and I have a seat, and I'm sort of twiddling my thumbs a little bit, and then I thought, okay, well, I need to catch up on some reading. I've been, I've been reading in the book of Numbers. And uh, so I pulled out my phone and got my Bible app out, and I continued to read in the book of Numbers. A fascinating book. You know, don't let the word Numbers uh, deceive you. But I started reading and reading chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter. My 2.30 third turns into 3 o'clock, 3.15. 3.30, and I'm tired now of reading, and finally, they, call, they take my car in at 3.30. Fortunately, it's done at about 4.10. So my 2.30 turns into 4.10, and you know, I hate waiting. Does anybody else here hate waiting? I hate, I, I hate to wait. You know, it's not that I'm important, but I would think that being the pastor of the Asher Glade Church of the Brethren would have a little bit of <laughs> pull, you know, that they could get me in. So, so I waited, and, and, and I made it through that day. So then Thursday, I finally take my wife's advice, and I go to the doctor because I've been fighting this for about five weeks now, six weeks, and I take her advice, strong suggestion, and, and I go to the doctor's Thursday morning in McHenry. I thought they opened at 10. I got there at 9.45 thinking that I could get there early, maybe be first. So I pull in at 9.45, and the door was open, but their sign said that they open at 9 o'clock, and they do open at 9 o'clock. But you know, I was the first one there at quarter till 10. They had no other customers. So I go in, and of course, she takes the information you need, and then she says, Mike, you can go over there and have a seat in the waiting room. I'm the first one there. But I said, okay. So I go over, and it's uh, 9.45, and... It wasn't long. It was like 9.55, and, and they, take, they take me back. And I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm the first one there, and I see, you know, the, uh, the nurse practitioner back there, and I said, hey, Sam, I'm ready for you. So, of course, she takes me into the room, and, and she takes my blood pressure, what they do. They take your temperature. They take your oxygen level. She asks you the 30 questions that she's supposed to ask you, and she said they'll be with you in a few minutes. I said, okay, no problem. Do you, know, and, and, do you know what another name for an examination room is, by the way? Waiting room. Waiting room. <laughs> yeah. Waiting room. So now it's 10 o'clock, 10 10, 10 20, 10 30. And of course, I was able to finish reading the book of Numbers. <laughs> 10 30, and finally he came in, spent about five with, no, actually, I spent a little time because they did a chest x ray. But finally they took care of me and set me on my way. The waiting room. I hate waiting. I hate waiting. It, 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 seems, it seems like it challenges us, you know? 
It really works on our patience, doesn't it? And the fact that we have to wait. I'm not sure if you're on, on, on board with me. I'm not sure if anyone this week has had to do any waiting and, and what that actually solves or what that actually works out. But, you know, in the, game, in the game of life, we have to do a lot of waiting. But there's another waiting room that it seems like our entire life we're in. And that's in the waiting room of God. It, uh, it just seems like, it seems like we're always waiting for God to do something. We're always waiting for God to move. We're waiting for Him to answer the prayers that we bring before Him. We're waiting for Him to heal our bodies of the sicknesses that we have. We're waiting for God to restore relationships with each other. We're, we're, we're waiting for God to give us the job or that opportunity that we need to bring financial freedom back to our houses and, and to do all these kinds of things. It seems like we're always waiting for God. And we have a tendency of growing impatient with God. At least I do. I mean, we were living in this instant world, aren't we? And, and, and we blame microwave ovens. When they develop microwave ovens, we throw something in the microwave oven and we get it just like that. We have on demand on television. I have on demand on my TV at home, and I never, I've never used it. And so yesterday, <coughs> uh oh, yesterday in preparation for the message this morning, yesterday in preparation for this morning, I said I wanted to figure out how on demand works. I couldn't figure it out, but I have on demand on my on my television at home. Instant potatoes, instant rice, instant whatever else you want to do for eating. You know, fast food which isn't always fast, but fast food. And then with the day and age of technology, I mean, we buy new technologies. Why do you buy the newest and the latest telephone, you know, the cell phones? Because they're better, they're faster, they do more of this, they do more of that. We upgrade our computers, and I don't upgrade a computer for I want because I want to go slower. I upgrade my computer because I want it to go faster. And so we have been conditioned as a society to expect instant gratification, instant answers. I'm at work and I, and I type out a report on my computer and I hit the print button. The computer is exactly eight feet behind me. Or, I'm sorry, my printer is exactly eight feet behind me in my office. So when I hit the print button, what I do is I push on, I don't even get up. I push on my chair, I slide back, and, and, I, and I, it's, a, it's a brand new printer. And I turn around, and it's just warming up. You know, I'm thinking about buying a new printer. Because the thing's slow. But we want instant gratification. We do this in our Christian walks. We want it right now. You know, we could be praying to God and, and asking God for something, and we say amen, and we open our eye, and expecting God to answer our prayers immediately. But God does not do that. God expects us, and He is teaching us to wait. He's teaching us how to wait, how to have patience. And it seems like we're always in the waiting room of God. And so when we take a look at our reading for this morning, we're looking at a character in the, in the Christmas story that we don't really think much about. I mean, Simeon is a man that we're going to learn about a little bit this morning, and the lessons that he can teach us that we just don't really think about him. I mean, there, there's no Christmas song with the name Simeon in it. When we have a Christmas play, you'll never see someone as a character of Simeon, but he plays an integral role in the Christmas story. Now, this story takes place 40 days after the birth of Jesus. This is a time required by the Levitical law that now Mary, after giving birth to Jesus, can take the baby to Jerusalem and she went through her purification rites and now she can bring the baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated to God. And we meet this man named Simeon. We don't know a whole lot about him. We don't know which one of the tribes he's from. But when we look at our scripture reading, we do learn a few things about him. It says in verse 25 that he was righteous 
and he was devout. He was a righteous man. He, he was a man who seeked after God. He was a man who followed the law of Moses. He believed in God. And the Holy Spirit revealed to Simeon that he would not die until he saw the consolation of Israel. He would not die until he saw the Lord's Messiah. He would not die until he saw Jesus. So we know that Simeon was an older man. And that he would come to the temple to pray, to worship God, to praise God. But the Holy Spirit revealed to him that he would not die until he saw Jesus. Now Simeon is unique in this fact. That when you look at the Christmas story, people would receive word from God, but they saw evidence of something. They saw evidence. Backing up, starting with the latest, let's take a look at Joseph. Joseph was ready to divorce Mary, or ready to, to put her, you know, to, to, to disassociate himself with Mary. But the angel Gabriel appeared to him. He saw a vision. He saw evidence, you know, and Gabriel spoke to him. Mary, Mary one night, the same angel appeared to her prior to that and told her that she would give birth to the Son of God. And as proof, she sees the angel. And then the angel says, go to the high country, to your cousin Elizabeth. She also will conceive, as conceived, and will be giving birth to a baby. Mary goes to the high country and sees Elizabeth, and sure enough, she's pregnant. The angel appeared in the temple to Zechariah with the same message, something that he saw. The angels appeared in the night sky on the night of Jesus' birth to the shepherds. They saw that. The star appeared in the sky for the magi, the wise men, the astrologers, if you would, to be able to go and follow that star that appeared to them to where Jesus was. But Simeon, Simeon was not like that. He had a revelation by the Holy Spirit to tell him that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. Something completely different. Most of us in this day and age that we live in, we need to see physical proof of something. And it's okay, you know, God reveals to us the physical. He will, he will show us things and, 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 and for us to help, to help us believe. But greater is he who is not seen and yet believes. And that was Simeon. The Holy Spirit just simply revealed to him that he will see the Messiah, the Savior of the world, before he died. That is where we're at. You know, we don't always be looking, don't always be looking for the what you can see. But allow the Holy Spirit to talk to you and believe the Holy Spirit for what the Holy Spirit tells you. But you have to get to a certain point in your life for that to happen. It just doesn't always happen that the Holy Spirit reveals things to people. We need to prepare our hearts just as we're in the Christmas season. We prepare our hearts for the coming of the Messiah, for the birth of Jesus. So it is in our lives that we need to prepare ourselves. We need to get to the point in our lives that we need to learn how to wait for the Lord. Simeon had to wait. The Holy Spirit revealed to him in some time past that he would see the Lord's Messiah. Don't know how far back that was. Could have been a week. It could have been a month. It could have been a year. It could have been five years. It was just simply revealed to him that he would not die to his soul. But he was righteous and he was devout. And he spent his time at the temple. He didn't have to see. He didn't have to have a vision of angels. He just simply had to have a revelation from the Holy Spirit. Waiting. I still hate to wait. I still 
hate to wait when I go out and do, do those things out there. And I, to be honest with you, I still hate, I hate to wait for God. So I still want that instant. But Simeon teaches us that we need to learn how to wait. And there's reasons we need to learn how to wait. You know, Jesus had a friend named Lazarus, Mary and Martha, his sisters. And word got sent to Jesus that he was sick. You remember the story? That he was sick. Please come. Please come. Your, your friend Lazarus is sick. Well, Jesus it says in the scripture, it says that he waited. Lazarus died. Mary and Martha were upset that Jesus waited. But Jesus had purpose and reason for that. David in the Psalm uh, uh, 27, in Psalm 27, it says, uh, he says, Wait for the Lord, be strong, and take heart. Again, he said, Wait for the Lord, as he reflected on his life. That is one reason why the scripture says that David was a man after God's own heart. He seek after God. He, has, he, he, he waited for the Lord. Have you ever tried to get ahead of the Lord? What's the result when we get ahead of the Lord? When we take things into our own hands and try to speed things up. It says in Isaiah, he says, But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. You want your strength to be renewed in the Lord. And in Job, he says, All the days of my heart service, I will wait for the renewal to come. When he was having conversation with his friends. All the days of my heart service, I will wait for the renewal to come. Patience. God's desire for you to learn how to wait for Him. So what can we pick up as we look at Simeon's life? Well, I think there's a couple of things that we really need to look at as to what waiting on the Lord can do for us. I still hate to wait, but here's what, here's what it can do. The first thing it can do for you and for me is it can fortify my faith. It can strengthen my faith as I learn how to wait for the Lord. It can build my faith. It can strengthen my faith. It can put a solid foundation into my faith life. Knowing and believing that God is God and He's still in control. Knowing and, 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 and having the, 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 the desire to reach out to Him in prayer. Just to increase my faith in Him. To know that He is God. And that He still rules. And he's, he's still on the throne. And He still can do... It says in the scripture, is there anything possible for God? God can do all things. But we need to wait on Him. And as we wait for the Lord to move, our faith gets strengthened. We build a stronger faith connection with the Lord. And that is what He wants us to do on a daily basis. He wants us to grow stronger in Him, in our faith walk with Him. When you look at your faith, and we do see signs, and it's good to see signs of people, and to see signs of miracles, and, and where God moves and performs miracles, that, 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 that our faith can be increased. But God sometimes causes us to wait just so our faith can be increased. <coughs> So that we can rely more on Him and less on us. So that we are more willing to turn it over to Him and get rid of it in our own abilities to do what we will think we need to do for God. We cannot hurry God up. God wants to teach you how to wait so that your faith can be strengthened. And I believe this is what we learned in Simeon, with Simeon. That his faith grew stronger and stronger and stronger as he waited on the Lord. See, as we wait on the Lord and in our faith walk, God has to, and believing that God and believing that God is going to do what it is that we want him to do or need him to do, a lot of things have to go in that process. Because in the story of Jesus, in this birth of Jesus, the Holy Spirit came and talked to Simeon. Revealed to him what was going to happen. But let's think of the process that all this had to happen. The angels had to also appear before Joseph and Mary and Zechariah. The, the angels had to appear before the shepherds. Before the wise men. 
a year to a year and a half prior to that, the angel had to go to Rome and knock on the emperor's door and tell the emperor that he needed to issue a taxation for all the Roman world because he was choosing, choosing Mary to be the mother of Jesus and Joseph, her, her espoused husband, to be the one who's going to help raise Jesus. He had to get them to Bethlehem because in the gospel or in the, uh, in the prophet Micah says that he will be born in Bethlehem. But they didn't live in Bethlehem. They lived in Nazareth. So God had to get them from Nazareth to Bethlehem. So how did he do that? He went to the emperor and said, issue a taxation for all the Roman world. So consequently, Joseph and Mary had to go from their home in Nazareth to Bethlehem. A long process. We need to have that kind of faith to know that God is moving even when we don't see him move. Second thing that we learn about as we read in Simeon as he's there in the temple. It says in our scripture that he is there and he's worshiping God. So he goes to the temple and he has faith and he prays. And the next thing we find out that Mary, Mary and Joseph bring the baby into Jesus into the, into the temple. And we see where Simeon worships God. Church, let me tell you that's this this morning. When you worship God, God begins to move. But your worship has to be authentic, and it has to be sincere. You know, you cannot manipulate God. You cannot trick God. You can't come here on a Sunday morning or be at home and say, Okay, Lord, I'm going to worship you now, so now do this. When you worship God, you're giving it all to Him. You're, you are lifting Him up and... You are worshiping God not because of what you want Him to do for you. You're, you're worshiping God because of who He is. That is why we worship God. Don't worship God thinking that you're going to be able to worship Him and then get what you want. We worship God because God is God. Knowing that He sits on the throne, knowing that God created everything that is in existence today, knowing that God has placed you where he wants you today, we worship God because he is sovereign, God is holy, God is righteous, God is just, God is a God of love, and he is deserving of all of our worship. Even when your times are going tough, even when things are going bad in your life, you need to be worshiping God. That's authentic worship. <coughs> You know, you can shock this whole church if you're going through tough times and hard situations in your life and yet you come to church on a Sunday morning with authentic, real worship to God. People are going to look at you and say, how can you do what you're doing when you're going through what you're going through? But see, your worship shouldn't have anything to do and be based on anything except for knowing that God is God. That's why we worship him. So we find that Simeon is in the temple constantly worshiping God. And then the third thing I think we learn as we read this story with Simeon is praise. He praises God. He thanks God for allowing him to see the Messiah. He told him way back whenever that he, was, he would not die until he saw him. And now he thanks him. How often are we to thank God? How, how often do we thank God? You know, <coughs> excuse me, the older we get, the quicker we are to thank God. Because we have life's experiences. We've been through things. We've seen things. We've done things. We've watched God operate. We've seen Him work. And we are quicker when we get older 
to praise God, to thank Him for what He has done. When we're younger, things just seem to come because our parents feed us, they nurture us, they raise us. The, you know, the little kids have a hard time really giving true thanks to God. Uh, don't want to pick on millennials, but millennials still have a hard time doing that. Andy raised his head on that one. To thank God on, you know, but we have, it's more of a challenge. But, you know, when you, when you get older, when you're part of that baby boomer generation, we're quicker to praise God. We're quicker to thank God for what He's done because we can look back in our lives and see all the things that God has done and how He's worked and how He has moved. And we thank Him. We praise Him. We lift Him up and, 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 we, and we have that spirit of thanks to Him. So we learn when we look at Simeon. We learn, we learn how to pray and we, we, we increase our faith in Him. In God. And we learn how to have authentic worship coming from your heart to God and to praise Him. So, as we are in the midst of this Christmas season and you look at the waiting that you have to do and going to the stores or going to the malls and you see the long lines and and all those things, just know that God is working on you, helping you develop the ability to wait, helping you learn how to be patient. As you have your needs, is, you know, we want, we want, like I said, we want God to move the mountain right now. We want Him to part the sea right now. But as we wait for Him to move, as we wait for God to move those mountains and to part, to part, and to part that sea. No, just know He's God and He is able. And, and, and He wants the best for you. But He wants you to take time this Christmas season to reflect on His goodness and on His love for you and just for you to know that God is still God and He's still in control and that his love for you is so great that the reason we have this Christmas season is, is to honor the birth of a king. But the reason for the Christmas season is to build to the Easter season. That the reason Jesus came is to go to the cross of Calvary. That's why he came. He came to die for your sins. And then to be raised again so that we can have eternal life with the Father in heaven. That's why He came. That's why. But when you have an opportunity, read this again and try to pull and glean out of those verses. But God wants you to know Salvation. Jesus. Just want to continue just real quick. In the Gospel of Luke, in the same setting of Simeon at the temple, it says in verse 36, there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Then coming up to them, meaning Mary and Joseph, at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. I believe she heard what Simeon had to say, and being a prophet herself, that she spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of of Jerusalem. So when you have that opportunity, read Luke beginning in verse 22, second chapter.